I think one of the big mistakes that, that startups do that often don't succeed in the community space is that they're designing for a million when they're trying to serve 50. Chris, what is happening, my man? Who we got lined up today? What's up, Sam? Big day today. We've got Andrew Lasofsky. He's the head of Coral by Vox, which is a platform that helps improve community on websites through smart technology, effective designs and strategies that work. And a big emphasis on strategies. It sounds like that's the uh, that, that's more or less the, the algorithm, so to speak, of what they bring to the table. Um, ultimately, their goal is to bring brands and communities they serve closer together by improving diversity of voices to create a safer online dialogue and experience. Uh, what did you think about the episode? Yeah, I thought it was incredible. This uh, Andrew definitely has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to growing and scaling and building effective, engaged, impactful communities. And I think he does a really good job at distilling it down into very actionable tactics. I think at one point he really breaks down a very step-by-step framework for how you can think about building community. I really like the principle he spoke to that technology supports community, but does not create it. So really always looking at tech as a mechanism of supplementing something that's already happening or an intention or community that's already built momentum in another way. And lastly, there's also a couple of really great resources he mentions um, with regards to different uh, academic research and books that pertain to community building. So I think all in all, this was a really great episode. So without any further ado, let's get into it. This week, we have the one, the only, Mr. Andrew Lasowski. Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Hey, very good, man. Very excited to have you on the show. Um, I, I think really just to kick things off, we'd really love to hear a, a little more detail about Coral and I mean, how you kind of came up with the concept and how thing and, and how the concept itself has developed throughout the years. That'd be fantastic. If you could start there, please. Sure. So, so Coral wasn't my original idea. I, I should say that, though I was the first person hired to to make it a reality. Um, the the idea behind Coral was a really unusual collaboration between the New York Times and the Washington Post and Mozilla, the people behind Firefox. Um, these are not three organizations that that really collaborate. The Times and the Post really almost never. And and the reason why this was happening in the first place was because they they realized that. Around journalism, there was a real lack of good community software to help journalists engage with their communities and communities to engage with each other. There were some and there still are some commenting platforms, but but their focus had really been on how can we take the data and sell it to advertisers? How can we sell access to these people? How do we accumulate scale uh, in order to, to then add really surveillance technology onto these news organizations' pages? It wasn't focused on community growth in a way that was sustainable or focused on the needs of the community and certainly not focused on the needs of the organizations either. So, so these three organizations got together with a grant from the Knight Foundation to, to look at what would it mean to, to build community software that's built for the community and not for venture capital. So, so that's how it began. And, and as I say, I was brought in as the first hire on this project to figure out what exactly it would be, um, who it would serve, how it would be built and, and create a team to make that a reality. That, that was now coming up on six years ago. Uh, and in that time, we, we've developed and grown, gone in a number of different directions. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, and then nearly two years ago, we joined Vox Media, um, Vox Media, who has Vox.com and The Verge, Polygon, New York Magazine, SB Nation, and, and so on, uh, as part of their product design and technology team, which itself uh, creates products that, that also are used by by other publishers, uh, as well as their, their own brands. So so that's really how, how we've grown and, and developed. And, and we started out with a real research focus. Um, because we had this large grant, we, we knew we didn't have to go to market immediately. So, so we took our time. Um, instead of hiring an engineer immediately or a CTO, the first hire was a community lead, even though we had no community, to say, what are we trying to build? What does it mean to build sustainable community? And, and we did a lot of research on the academic side of community software, because we've been doing this for more than 30 years now. We, we know some of the mistakes that, that, that are being made, and yet new startups come along and, and make them again and again and again as if we've not learned. And it turns out there's all this community academic research and all these researchers who've never spoken to product people or technologists just doing this work for themselves. So, so we really started focusing on that and, and that gave us a direction to head in. 
That's amazing. It's that, that's that's a much bigger story than I actually realized um, in, from from the uh, inception and you know bringing it to life and uh, you know obviously helping like loads of publishers. But how um wondering if you could explain a little bit about how the platform functions. Like how how is it assisting in you know creating that connection between journalists and um, commentators, the community, so on and so forth. Sure. I should say that it, it is used by some outside journalism as well, but but right now journalism is is our main use case. Um, although we're we're having some great conversations in other spaces as well. Um, okay. there, there's a few key principles that that help and empower and enable the the community to to be supportive of each other and and of the journalism. Um, first of all, the the principle that we are not creating a centralized data repository for all of these users. These users don't log in with us. They log in with each company individually. We don't collect and, and gather their data together. We don't want their data. Um, sure, we, we'll store it because in, in order for the platform to run, but at the end of a contract, we wipe it all. Um, our business model is not based on data. Uh, and so that gives us a freedom as a technology company that, that most technology companies don't, don't have to be able to focus on, okay, what are we building and, and for whom? And so what that means is, first of all, you have your own existing registration and login system. You don't have to use ours. In fact, we'd rather you use yours. It should be one unified experience. You can highly customize that experience, the look, the feel, not just the, the colors and the fonts, but of course that as well, but, but really moving things around wherever you already have them on your app or on your site, on your own profile page. You don't have to have a separate one. Um, Put, put things in your own systems in a way that, that people expect them to navigate. And we don't put our logo on it. Um, our logo, why should we be selling to your community? That we, that's not our business model. So we don't want them to know this is a third party creating this. It should feel native. It should feel part of the, the community experience. Um, and then from there, really, it comes into the design of the tools, which are, which are designed for productive and supportive community, not designed for constant addiction and short-term growth. And, and and what I mean by that is that, that we spend uh, a huge amount of effort trying to make sure that, that all of the pieces are opt-in, not opt-out. We're not tricking people into signing up for notifications. We're not ringing things on your phone constantly. We're not saying, hey, you need to come back to the community right now. And you log in, you go there, and it goes, have you considered looking at somebody else's feed? And you're like, why did I just log in for this alert that you gave me? And of course, that's there to juice the numbers. But but we're not trying to juice those numbers. What we're trying to do is, is to grow sustainable community. Um, and then the other piece that, that really differentiates us is that we've put an enormous amount of our time and resources, not only into what the community is doing and, and their experience, but also that of the moderators. And, and in many ways, the, the moderation experience is the forgotten piece by technology companies because it's like, well, we have a million users on that end and only 20 on this end. So for that 20, we can, you know, they'll, they'll just deal with it. We'll just make it simple boxes. Whereas for our feeling, that 20 are the ones who make the conversations among the million either productive or not, insulting or not, dangerous or not. And, and so for us, really the focus of, of making the moderation experience sophisticated, uh, simple, streamlined, quick in a way that uses AI to help, but is not run by AI. And um, we can talk more about that. Uh, and in ways that, that is really focused on people who manage the communities are the ones who make this community rise or fall. And so, so that's one of the key areas that, that we've always put a lot of work into. Yeah, and no, I think that's a great call out too. And I'm sure that's just one of the many learnings that you've uh, come across as you've seen and helped build and grow these different communities, the importance of effective moderation, so much so that you've heavily integrated that into the product roadmap in order to, to help facilitate and catalyze that. In your experience, I mean, um, what are some other big takeaways or, or things that you've seen that are, are signals or underlying principles within really effective communities? Sure. I mean, I, I think the first and most important thing is that if a community is failing, it, it probably isn't a technology problem. Um, technology is part of the solution, but it's it's not the reason why things work and don't work. Communities ultimately are a strategy and culture question, and then technology helps you enable that strategy and culture or not. So, so the communities that we see that, that fail, it's almost never because of the technology itself, although the technology has biases that make some things easier and harder. Um, it's very much about the strategy. So, so while uh, I was just talking 
as we what we are. We 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 a technology company that also does editorial and so on. Um, but but what we offer is not just technology; it's strategy, and and that's one of the key uh, learnings that that we have and that we have to offer is is you know we've built our tool with biases. They're biases towards certain kinds of engagement and interaction. But if you don't know what it is that people are doing there in the first place, if you don't provide a compelling reason for people to want to be there to interact with each other, if you're not helping improve their lives in some way, um, then it really doesn't matter which technology platform you choose, us or someone else, um, and if you aren't making it clear what your value proposition is. I mean, there's there's really just a handful of things that, that I've learned that, that I feel like a, a whether or not, a real sort of indicators as to whether or not a community is, is successful or not. Um, and that's, first of all, is it clear what this is for when people go there and how they will benefit from participating? Um, secondly, is it easy for them to participate? Okay, I get what this is. Now, how do I log in? Where, where do I write? What do you want me to do? Then the, the third thing is, is it clear what is expected of me here? What are the rules? How do you want me to behave? What is not acceptable here? Uh, and then the final piece is, are these rules being visibly enforced or not? Does anybody care? Do they say they don't want this kind of behavior, but then when I get there, all I can see is, is people attacking each other and I guess they're, they're just paying lip service to it. Is it visually being enforced and encouraged in, in different ways? So, so those four pieces are, are sort of the areas that, that we've learned uh, are really the, the key difference between whether our software helps uh, or, or not with, with a client. Uh, it's, it's not the software, although the software is the piece then that, that then they can use. It's, it's really about the strategy. Yeah, no, no. I think that really lays down a solid foundation of uh, a very tactical approach. And then also just from a very high level principle, as far as making sure that, um, I mean, the technology is really just there to support uh, something that will already be happening or needs to be happening if it's going to work well. In, the, in that same vein, I mean, I think those are uh, great learnings. You you referenced academic research in the fields of community and how you started by kind of hiring ahead of community before there even was a community. I, I think... Um, I mean, first of all, to me, that's something I just learned something right now. Like, I, it didn't necessarily occur. I mean, I guess that I thought about it. I'm sure there are there's always interesting academic research that fails to fully get applied by a lot of practitioners in business communities. So, with that said, are there specific uh, things that you found really interesting in, in in kind of an academic research field within community that you can reference? Yeah, there's there's a great there's a great uh, many things I would say that uh, that I've I've come across and learned, and also a, a great many things that uh, that I think are still to be learned. We've learned as much about the gaps. Um, th there is a fun uh, sort of foundational paper that that if uh, if you haven't read, I highly recommend. It's just called Brand Community. It's from 2001. Um, I just looked up the authors. It's uh, Muniz and O'Gwin. Uh, and 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 this for me, when when starting out, uh, someone recommended this to me, and I did feel like this was sort of uh, creating a lot of the bases of understanding uh, the ways of thinking about community in different spaces. Um, one of the things that we also have found, and, and we've commissioned our own research as well, and, and we publish a lot of it on our website, um, is, is also around where, where there isn't as much research. So, um, for example, there, there really wasn't much research on um, uh, women of color in communities and gender non-binary people of color, especially in the communities that, that we serve, um, and, and whether or not uh, uh, different groups of people who are more traditionally marginalized, why, if they don't feel welcome, why that is, and and what can change in the design if we want to change some of the demographics of the, the community. There's there's a lot of focus in every industry right now to look again at uh, uh, the demographics of the leadership. Um, and also, we should be looking at the demographics of the community and are there decisions that we're making uh, unintentionally based on who we hire, who's on our team, uh, who's making decisions, what kind of research we're doing. Um, that that is making it more welcoming for for some voices than others. So so we've we've done a lot of work trying to understand those voices that are traditionally missing from many spaces, uh, and uh, or have gone to spaces for of of their of their own for products that serve them better. And and what can we learn from from different spaces? And for us, the first thing has always been hiring a, a diverse team and making sure that there are a range of experiences. For example. Um, we right from the beginning we we made sure that there were people represented from different uh, uh, marginalized groups who had themselves been marginalized and insulted and stalked and attacked online. 
um, because how could we try to build tools to prevent that if we didn't have people who knew exactly what that felt and what it meant and how the system was used against them. So so um, for us, it's it's really been looking at who is doing interesting work in these areas, what, where are the gaps, can we help fill those gaps? Um, and and yeah, there's, there's not one learning from that as much as there is the learning that there is so much out there uh, that is that is really interesting, and there's um, there's another book as well about building. Uh, I'll I'll send uh, I'll send you the the information after if you want to put it in the show notes uh, about um, uh, social. It's a summary of social science research into online communities and and things we can learn when building those. Uh, it's a very um, accessible book. Paul Resnick is is the editor, but I'll send you the information a bit. And uh, uh, yeah, that that I found was a really good primer as well. That's, that's, that's really interesting. The, um, especially the point about segmentation, really understanding the various like audience inputs, um, you know, who's in that community. I think it's really important for marketers, obviously, to understand, uh, all those different aspects. I'm curious, uh, when it comes to engaging communities, like what are some of the ways, you know, strategically that you advise people on, you know, brands directly on, um, you know, gauging success, like how, how is something going well versus not going well, um, in, in terms of community moderation, in terms of, um, you know, like community member to community member engagement, so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's something that we we think about a lot um, because really it, it depends as much about what what is the ultimate reason for the community to exist. Um, are you a brand that sells sneakers? In which case, it is ultimately it's selling sneakers, or it's about people's perception of those sneakers and that brand. Um, if you are working in journalism, then it can be as much about housing a a good discussion uh, that allows people to to support each other or share points of view that uh, that they may not otherwise encounter. Or it might be how many leads do we get out of this for future stories? Or it might be how engaged are these subscribers? Or how often are people returning to the page? Um, so, so some of these things are, are clear um, kind of metrics in terms of, of standard uh, 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 website metrics for an engagement. Um, but, but on the other hand, that doesn't tell you anything about the quality. Um, so you could say our goal is 200 comments, and I can tell you exactly how to get 200 comments tomorrow. Just let spam bots loose on your site. You've hit 200. Congratulations. Um, and and so really, it, it then comes down to questions of quality, and that becomes very difficult to manage uh, into, uh, and very difficult to measure. I'm sorry. So, so you could say, is a measure of quality a lack of toxicity as measured? by some uh, some sort of NLP uh, rating system. Well, maybe, but that's that's a measurement of bad. That's not a measurement of good. Um, is is a good co- uh, comment uh, one that helps support somebody, gives them an answer, helps improve their life in some way? Yes, but how do you measure that at scale? Um, what does that even mean? And 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 also, to what extent are you able to understand how much people value the community and and what it means to them? So so for us, it's always going to be a mix of quantitative and qualitative, which is to say interviewing people and looking at the numbers. Um, we look closely at how many new commenters have come in uh, or, or new community members have joined in this period who have not been banned for being spammers or being abusive mm-hmm. or, or other things, um, and then have stuck around and become more loyal. So they come back and post uh, 10 times a, a month, for example. Uh, and then you can start to look at networks. How much are they talking only within a certain circle or are they engaged? with many people? How much is it uh, people giving thumbs up or like? We actually use respect instead of like. Um, and to what extent are you able to see these connections building? How, how much is it helping foster the kind of dialogue you want? But, but ultimately, when it comes down to measuring success, it has to be, what is the function of this community? We said, um, what is the goal for people coming into the community? Your goals as a company may be different, and and I think that's really important to to say as well. You need to measure both, um, because you know you your goals may be um, increasing page value loyalty and upping your subscription numbers. That's not the community's goal. They don't care yeah. about your subscription numbers, mm-hmm. so they have their own goals about creating um, a, of whether it's um, learning more about themselves, whether it's having a space to respond, feeling heard. Um, so so I think you need to measure uh, metrics around what the community these goals are separate from and as well as measuring your own goals. Um, but there isn't a single like magic engagement number because there can't be um, in the same way that, you know, how do you measure having a good life uh, is not going to be a single same measurement for everybody. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. I, <clears throat> with the minute you kind of talked about the, uh, you know, the brand's goals versus the community members' goals made me think of a Venn diagram, obviously. Yeah. But um, it also makes me think like, you know, what are some of the greatest pitfalls? I mean, is that one of the biggest pitfalls? Is just like the the mismatch of goals, like the misalignment? Or what, what would you say you tend to see on your end where, you know, maybe the brand gets it a little bit wrong or they're looking at things a little bit incorrectly? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing that people get wrong is underinvestment in their community management. Um, not enough moderators, not enough uh, trained moderators in particular, um, mm. not enough engagement. Uh, expecting either the community to police itself or only seeing moderation as a form of policing rather than a form of encouragement and nurturing. Um, so, so we actually did a, a big study looking at um, 20 different uh, communities around journalism of very different sizes all across the US. And uh, one of the questions we asked was, um, do you think anybody here is ever moderating or removing bad comments? Now, this was true for all of them. Of course there were. There were moderators in all of these sites. What we found was fascinating was only just over half of people said, yes, they thought there was. And, and actually, the reason was because they couldn't prove a negative. The comments had been removed. So they only saw some bad comments, uh, but they didn't know that they weren't the worst. And, and, and so, so what we found was that because all the, the, the moderators were doing was removing, there was no evidence that they'd ever been there. And so they felt like the community was never being looked at, which meant that they often felt they could behave any way they wanted or that nobody cared. And, and so really what, what it came down to is, is trying to retrain these moderators into being, yes, you need to remove these terrible things, but also when you see something good, say, thank you, this is great. And our system you know, indicates with a badge and people can sign up for notifications when a staff member replies, be more engaged. Um, because first of all, that shows the community that you care. It encourages and rewards them for giving the kinds of things you want. Um, and also uh, it will reduce the level of moderation you need to do anyway because it's clear that someone is watching so you won't get away with everything uh, and so so the biggest mistake that we see is people setting up communities and then being invisible behind the curtain uh, because then there's no engagement and they're there engaging with the brand because they want to be heard by people at the brand that's one of the key reasons they want to be there um, and being silent in that space and not present is is one of the worst mistakes you can make it makes really tons, tons of sense. And I feel like lots of different brands are all making that mistake. Um, with that said, uh, one of the last question, one of the last questions here is in regards to, I, I know you have a breadth of experience and expertise as it pertains to supporting and nurturing and, and growing communities. What do you feel? You've shared a lot of principles and tactics. Can you share some uh, one example of a, a company, whether it's a client or just somebody that you, you follow and respect or a community that personally you may be involved in that you think is a great community and, and kind of deconstruct why? Um, sure. Uh, so what I'm going to pick is is um, KPCC and the, the LAist, which is um, uh, in California. It's a public radio station. Uh, they, they own both of those. Um, actually, I'll pick two. I'll pick them and I'll also pick City Bureau in, in Chicago. Um, K KPCC and LAist are, are really about public service journalism and uh, really focused on how do they serve their community better. Um, and they're doing an incredible job right now answering questions around the coronavirus and around the election, which is taking place today when we're speaking, uh, and and really um, making sure that it is easy for people to reach out, to connect with each other, and especially to connect with them, to, to serve what are the needs of that community and answer specific questions. It's very clear what the need is because people go there, ask them questions, and they have a whole team on hand answering them quickly and working with the journalists and the community together to be able to, to answer them. So they do an incredible job. Um, and then also City Bureau in Chicago. Um, they're a fantastic organization, really rethinking what does it mean to serve with and for the community of the South Side of Chicago. Um, and uh, and they create communities who go out fact finding, documenting public meetings, being highly engaged in what are the needs here, uh, and then serving those based on what is needed. And and just an example of that was that they they created their community guidelines using a Google Doc that they opened out to their community and said, "Help us form these guidelines. What do you think the lines should be?" Uh, and then created this in a collaborative way. So so um, yeah, I, I think both of these organizations are doing really phenomenal 
phenomenal job in making journalism feel connected to the communities they're serving and, and part of those communities in a way that the industry in general, I think, is really struggling right now. Hmm. Yeah, this, I mean, <clears throat> talk about, you know, timely use of one of the best community functionalities, especially with all the uncertainty going on. So, um, and yeah, the election, crazy. Uh, so we're about running up on time, but there is one last question that we ask every guest and uh, it's going to put you on the spot a little bit, but you know, you're, you, you know, so much about community building. So I f we feel like comfortable doing it, but if you were to start a new D 2 C product company from scratch and you've got, let's say it's called a hundred K to work with, how would you go about building a community around that? Oof. Well, <laughs> and also what would that company be? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I don't know what it would be, but I know how I'd go about it. And I'll, I'll say this, that, okay, um, I would, I would, I would go about it by starting to find a need that a group of people have and have in common. Um, I would start it small. Uh, that doesn't have to be local, but local is a good way to, to do that. And I would start it in a way that uses existing platforms probably free platforms. I probably think about, do I want to start with a newsletter? Do I want to start on Facebook? Do I want to start um, on Twitter? People have started communities, although it's a little bit harder there. Um, but I would, I would start with free tooling and or in person, but now is not a good moment for that. Uh, and, and do it in a way that was deliberately designed not to scale. Um, I think one of the big mistakes that, that startups do that, that often don't succeed in the community space is that they're designing for a million when they're trying to serve 50. And, mm -hmm. and when you look at successful communities like Nextdoor, I mean, you know, the beginning of Nextdoor was someone going house to house in their community and gathering people in a front room. Clearly couldn't scale. It didn't matter. The point was, can we serve what this community needs and create something that isn't there right now to bring people together, to listen to each other, support each other uh, and give and provide something that, that everybody needs. Then once you've solved that, then your next problem is how do we take it from one to three? And then your next problem is how do we take it to 10 and then your next and so on. Um, wh whereas now everybody is launching and designing for when I get my buyout and I'm bought by some venture capitalist for 3 billion, it needs to be able to serve 100 million people. So I'm going to build it for 100 million people when there's nobody there. There's nobody who wants it yet. So so I would take that 100K. I would use free tools. Um, I would start with, with what is this community? Identify it, spend time in and around it, um, talk to lots of people with then I would then my first hire would be someone who is in and part of this community. If I'm part of it as well, all the better. Um, and someone different from myself, and uh, and then start to try and solve that in the smallest, most local, or, or most uh, unscalable way possible, and build it from there. I love that. That's uh, that's one of one of the better answers, even though you didn't have a specific product in mind, but very actionable, um, you know, directions on how to actually go about it and. It makes me, you know, think about like, know thyself, you know, are you being authentic to the problem that you're trying to solve, which is something that we hear so much about, um, you know, intentionality is really important. So, uh, you know, great answer. So thanks so much for having, for, uh, for joining us. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate your input on all this. It's my pleasure. Thank you for yeah. supporting good community practice. Absolutely. Man, well, that was a great episode. I really enjoyed hearing what Andre had to say. I think he, uh, I mean, really loved his approach to that that step by step framework for helping build communities. I think really making sure that you understand the goals of your community and not just getting caught up in your own company goals and that the goals or outcomes you have if you have a successful community. I think just that kind of like empathy driven approach to ensuring you're really able to help support your customers goals and challenges is, is really at the foundation. And I think as you're thinking about how your community will function, how you want people to participate, what's the value you want to create. I think it's always going to stem from that level of empathy and understanding. Don't be afraid to interview and have conversations with your customers. Um, it's a lot easier to operate in a vacuum, but it's a lot more effective to make sure you're doing and building in a very collaborative way. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I thought the, the points that he brought up around, um, you know, what the brand goal is versus what the community goal is, I think is really important um, because a lot of times the brand can act like a squawk box to a certain extent and not really understand, uh, you know, the drivers of like creating a really engaged and focused community. Uh, 
uh, you know, even even further on that, one of the biggest uh, pitfalls that he mentioned, which I thought was a really great call out, was just uh, a lack of community moderators, you know, not investing enough in, in somebody who can like lead that conversation from the brand side with the community. Um, you know, really, he brought up a really interesting point where uh, if, if you lack a lot of moderation, typically the, the go-to is just kind of like taking down negative comments. And then, you know, maybe the community doesn't even actually realize there's a moderator there. So I think it's just some really, generally speaking, some really great takeaways in terms of how to really engage consumers online. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That's all we got for this week. We'll be back next week. 